big. So we'll see if I can succeed. So to begin with, I'm going to just give you an overview of actually what's in the, in the new version of the, the technical guidelines document itself before I get into anything practical. So an inspired download service is essentially the mechanism by which end users can gain access to your, your data by downloading it from the internet. Um, and an inspired download service can either be used to download whole copies of a data set or individual parts. And where practicable, the whole end game or the, the kind of option, the preferred option is to enable ac access to the individual features directly. So rather than having to download the whole data sets and be able to use them in, in your various applications. So within the, within the download services specification now, they've defined two, two types of download service. So the first one is a, a predefined download service, and this is where you have your data set, um, and it's either represented as a, as a full data set, or you can subset it up, and these files are then accessed directly from a, a to stored within a file or, or data repository, and your end users download them in their entirety. Um, the content of the, the data set that the user gets access to can't be changed. So whatever for, file format you've used for encoding or coordinate reference system that you encode the geometry in, that's what the, uh, the end user will get. If it's not what they need, then they have to do some additional transformations um, when they download it. And the second type of, of download service is what they're terming a direct access download service. So these are much more sophisticated download services, and they are going to allow the user to actually define their own queries or request criteria to subset the, the actual data down to return only the features they need. So for example, give me all of the data within a bounding box area, give me only feature type A or B, or just give me one feature back. Um, I want to get this feature called um, ABC. Or Select all the features that are valid between time one and time two, so 2011 and 2012, and within a bounding box. So you can also, the users can also request the data in different coordinate reference systems, and these types of direct access download service um, allow the user to actually retrieve the data in for forms that they want, rather than the forms that you guys want to provide it to them in. And in addition to, to, to that, uh, they've also given the download services another kind of classification. So you can have a non-interoperable inspired download service. And that type of download service, the type of data that you provide back is how you have it right now. So it's not transformed into the inspired various different inspired data specifications themselves. So if you provide access to your data as an Esri shapefile or uh, a geotiff or, or anything like that, or an archive file, that you serve that through the download service. But once you transform the data into um, the harmonized, in relevant harmonized inspired data specification and provide access to that version through the download service, then you can truly say that you have an interoperable inspired download service. So the time scales for actually implementing the download services they're actually um, a lot sooner than a lot of people think. So if you're an Annex 1 or an Annex 2 provider, the deadline is for implementation is uh, December this year. So you've got six months before you have, and, and in that time you've got to set up your download service, but just providing access to the data as you provide it today. For those of you that are Annex 3 data providers, your timelines aren't that much better. So you've got until December next year, and by that, at that point in time, you've got to set up the Inspire download services. Again, just providing access to the data as it is today. Unless you're providing um, access, unless your data set is new if you're an Annex 1 provider. Um, and the time scales for actually providing, having a, a truly interoperable Inspire download service, well, it's 2015 for Annex, Annex 1 data providers and 2020 for Annex, Annex 3. 
So that gave you a high level overview of the different category types of inspired download service that are defined in, in the download services specification. So we're now going to look in a bit more technical detail about what actually is required for each of the different options that are defined there. Um, so again, the technical guidelines, they actually uh, define how you would implement it rather than what is just required. And what you'll find is there's some additional requirements being specified in the, in the technical guidelines on top of what's in the implementing rule to actually have a, a truly conformant inspired download service. Um, so you've got to hit those, those requirements plus the, the legally binding ones to have a truly conformant inspired download service. So for, from a legal point of view, the, the requirement at the abstract level, um, all download services need to support four types of operation. So the first one being get the download service metadata. So can you download the, have, have a link to the ISO 19139 metadata record that you've described the service using. Uh, get spatial data set operation that allows you to download the actual get access to the data set. A describe spatial data set operation. So if you hit ask for that, it will return a description of the data model that's used for encoding the, the data. So for an Inspire data set, that's a, a reference to the Inspire feature catalog. If you're saving, serving your data as it stands right now, it's some sort of reference to a data dictionary or um, some uh, product da data specification, for example. Uh, and the link download service, which is the capability to upload a metadata record describing the service. And on top of that, if you're going to provide access to a, a direct access service, so allow users to submit requests and get back subsets of features, you've also got to support the get spatial object operation. So that allows you to request individual features and the, the describe spatial object type. And that's pretty much the same as the, the describe spatial data set operation. And if you're going to implement a direct access service, then within the get special operation, get spatial object operation, um, it needs to support the following uh, request criteria. So you must allow users to get a feature by its identifier, allow users to retrieve data in different coordinate reference systems if the download service supports it, and support all logical comparison and temporal operators and the bounding box spatial filter. And the, the kind of quality of service, also the non-functional requirements are, uh, the one of interest is for the actually downloading the data itself. So the get spatial data set or get spatial object. So your download service, as soon as a user requests it, it must respond back to the user within 30 seconds and then have a sustained response of um, half, a, half a megabyte a second. So I think they're, they're fairly achievable. For, for most types of services, so that shouldn't be too difficult for, to meet those. So again, just to kind of reiterate, in the download services specification document, they, they actually define three, three possible options for an Inspire download service. An Atom feed, an OGC WFS serving predefined data sets, or an OGC uh, WFS serving features. Um, so far, the technical guideline specifications have focused on the types of download service that are required for the Annex 1 themes. So the technical guidance document is a living document, so it will be updated in the next, over the next year to include additional service types such as the web coverage service for elevation and orthoimetry type information and some of the, the meteorological data and the sensor observation service as well. So we're going to actually look at what, what the requirements are for each of those uh, three different data sets uh, and look at each in turn with a practical demonstration at the end. So again, we're going to use the Natura 2000 data set to do so. So again, uh, just to reiterate, we've downloaded the EEA data set for Natura 2000 and this is uh, actually an Esri shapefile and an access database. 
And what we did is we integrated both of those data sets together to be able to publish it out as, uh, to the Inspire Protected Sites Annex theme. Um, and integrated it into an Oracle database. And then we're going to use our Go Publisher product to configure the schema transformations that are, that are required to transform it into the protected sites theme. Uh, but the key aim of this workshop is to actually focus on demonstrating the, the process for once you've configured the schema mappings, how you then publish it out. So when, when I actually went about Setting, setting up this, uh, this demo, I actually went through four different steps to, to actually configure each of the different types of, of Inspire download service. So as we've got a really large data set, for, it's, it covers 25 member states, if we publish the try and publish the data out as a single file or a single request so the users can get access to all the whole EEA data set, it'll actually overwhelm most download services. So the first thing that, that I had to do was actually start to think about how on earth you can, for the predefined side of thing, data set side, how do we chunk up the data so that users can retrieve it in, in more bite-sized chunks? So we looked at you splitting up and subsetting the data uh, according to country code. So our EEA Natura 2000 data set will actually be served out as 25 individual kind of files or service requests. Um, we had to update some of the schema transformation mappings in order for us to do that. Um, then we had to, as part of the whole process of setting up the, the Inspire download services, you have to configure some capabilities metadata for the service. And then sit and think about how on earth do you want to, what output format do you want to um, have allow people to download the data in? Do you want allow, to allow them to get access to the raw data is raw GML, for example, or would you like to compress it so it improves performance um, when downloading? The next step, we had to create, again, some ISO 919139 metadata. Uh, so to do that, all we had to do was update, like make some minor updates to the existing um, metadata record that was defined by the EEA and create some service metadata. Um, it's an absolute requirement that you have to produce metadata that describes both the data set and the service and publish that to, the Inspire, uh, to an Inspire discovery service. Once you've done all of that, th those kind of two key steps, you're ready to actually deploy the Inspire download service in any associated resources and um, you're ready to go. And then the final step is the metadata that you, you created is to actually publish the, that metadata into an Inspire Discovery service so people can actually find your download service and know that it's been made available. So, yeah, those are the, the kind of four, four core steps that you have to go through once you've configured the schema mapping for actually creating your Inspire download service. So, we've got, um, we've got I've got our Go Publisher pro product, which is generally, which is, you can be used to configure the, the, Go, the Go Publisher. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, the schema mappings, and when it comes to actually developing an Inspire download service, uh, with our Go Publisher product suite, we've got three different options that, that you can go down depending on on kind of um, how much data you have to to publish. So uh, at the lower end, we've got our entry-level product called Go Publisher Desktop, which is a really cost-effective um, solution. So for any organization that has very small data sets um, that can publish their data as a single file, then this is perfect for, for use to configure an Atom feed and generate your Inspire-compliant data set and also the metadata and then publish them, make them available. For organizations that have very, very large data sets or really dynamic data sets, so meteorological organizations, people with, have air quality that's changing constantly, then we have our Go Publisher Agent uh, product, and that's used to uh, generate both the data and the metadata and the Atom feed automatically at regular intervals, so you can do scheduling, and it's perfect for, for national mapping agencies where you can't publish your whole data set in a, in a single file. 
So it's got the capabilities for defining all sorts of different subsetting and chunking mechanisms to enable users to access their data. And then finally, we've got Go Publisher WFS. Um, and this is the one, this is a key product that can be used for setting up um, as a direct access WFS, for example. But you can also configure it to serve out predefined data sets as well, even though that's not kind of the prime, prime use case typically for a WFS. So we're going to focus initially on, on Atom feeds and how, how would you set one of these up for either your existing data set or for a data set that's been transformed into the inspired data specifications. So Atom feeds, um, people were quite surprised when Atom was used as, a, as defined as an inspired download service. Um, as they're typically used, uh, it's a, it's a web-based content and metadata syndication format that is, is generally the protocol for publishing or, or notifying end users of when content on a website has changed. But one of the great things is that about Atom feeds is it can be used to notify end users when a data set has changed so that they should download the, the actual resource. And now that we're actually being required to publish your data online, that can be seen as, as content. So the Atom feed can just contain a link to the data set. So you then just publish a, an updated version of the Atom feed with an updated entry in saying it's changed and then the end user can immediately download load it. Um, another good thing is that the users can actually subscribe to Atom feeds. So it reduces the need for them to actually repeatedly go back to your data set or your data set, your website, sorry, to check for updates or wait until you send a, an email. And they're really simple to, to generate. So the actual implementation costs and complexities are, are pretty low, which is great. And for, from the end user point of view, the end users don't need any, any sophisticated technology to, to be able to, to use a, an Inspire download service based on Atom. Um, generic web browsers like Firefox and Opera, Opera? Opera. It's getting confused with uh, another person. Um, you can use those for uh, reading the Atom feeds. Or alternatively, you can use feed readers to, to actually subscribe to them and they will aggregate and you can have them aggregating with your other RSS feeds. So you can use things like Google Reader or even Hootsuite. You can integrate it into your social media and, and also your email. So as soon as the a new version of the data set is available, you'll be alerted and you can immediately just follow that link and download the data. So the Atom feed itself, it's just another piece of XML documentation and it's made up of two parts. The actual uh, top part of the metadata uh, of the Atom feed just has some descriptive metadata that describes itself. So who created it, when it was last updated, some, some links to other resor related resources, for example. And it also contains one or more entries and each of these entries represents a data set that you can, you can download. So. Within the Inspire context, um, to actually set up an Atom feed, it is a little bit more complicated than if you would set up an RSS feed based on your website to alert people for, for new content. Um, they want you to set up two Atom feeds. So they want you to set up an, a top level Atom feed itself and that will represent the Inspire download service. And within that Atom feed it will contain a set of entries and each of those entries will represent an individual data set feed. And each of those data set feeds themselves, they contain the link to the data. So the Atom feed contains a set of entries which link to another, another uh, feed, Atom feed. And in that top level um, Atom feed as well, you also need to provide some additional resources or links to additional resources, not just the, the data set feed itself. So you need to have, um, add in a link to the service metadata record that you deployed into the Inspire download service describe, discovery service, describing the, the download service itself and one to the 
to each of the data sets that are contained, and also generate something called an open search document. And this open search description document will fulfill the operations or the, the, yeah, the operations for the described spatial data set and the, the get spatial data set operation. So within each of the data set feeds themselves, each entry contains a link to, to uh, an individual representation of the data set. So if you're going to provide access to your data in multiple CRSs, you'd have a separate entry in each data set feed for each coordinate reference system. Or if at the moment you provide access to your data in multiple dan uh, encoding formats, such as a shapefile, a uh, map info, a tab file, again, you'd have a separate entry for each of those. So although that diagram looks complicated, it's not. So Within the feed itself, um, the, yeah, the technical guidelines document requires you to provide five elements to describe the, the feed. So the title, an ID, the author, the time that it was updated, and any access and, con on con access and use rights. And these should be the same as what you've put into your metadata. And you can optionally also put in a subtitle and uh, uh, define the, the geographic extent. Of, what, of your data set using a GeoRSS polygon. And by using GeoRSS polygon and ha putting the uh, extent in, it allows you to, users to be able to read your atom feed and view it in things like Google Earth and Google Maps, and also uh, QGIS and other, other things that can read RSS. In addition to those, you need to provide a, a set of links to additional resources. So for the top level feed, you need to provide your links to your ISO metadata, so for both the service and the data set. Um, have a reference to the open search description. It needs to have a, self -re a reference to itself. And if you provide access to the, the feed in an alternative representation, so you, for example, if you've got the feed in English and in German, um, it, you would refer to the other, other representation of the feed. And finally, the only thing that's different that's required in the, in the dataset feed itself is that the dataset feed links out to a description of the, the spatial objects that are contained within the data. And when you're defining each of the links in the RSS feed, you need to provide uh, the following attributes. So the first one being the URL where you can actually access the resource, so the data set or the, or the feed itself. The relationship of the resource, for each of the different types of things that I mentioned at the bottom, they've defined what that relationship should be in the, in the technical guidelines. And again, with the MIME type. And you can also add in a title to describe what the actual link is. So as you can see, uh, you're required to add in multiple links, so adding a title in so users can distinguish which one link from another is really useful. So here's an example of, a, of an Atom feed. So we can see that we have a title, a subtitle, which actually is, is the same as, a, a, as the abstract in your ISO metadata. Um, third link is the link to the, the service metadata, uh, the self-reference to itself, and an alternative to say that the feed is available in German, and a link to the open search document, and again, a link to the ID of the feed, which should be a URL to itself, and some rights information. And it's the same in the, in the dataset feed. And again, to describe the entry, entries themselves, you only need to, to provide four or five, five mandatory elements, so the title, ID, update, um, a list of all the coordinate reference systems that the data set's available in, and the link to the feed, or the data set itself. And again, you can optionally include a subtitle, author, rights, and a GRSS polygon. So that's just a quick example of, of what the, the feed would look like in the, the download service feed. So it, for each entry to each individual data set, uh, you have a, a link to the, the download service feed in there. And the only difference in the data set feed is 
The link contains a, a link to the data set itself and a, list, and a reference to the coordinate reference system that it's available in. So to quickly show you how, um, how you can generate a, an Atom feed using Go Publisher Desktop, So Go Publisher Desktop is the is um, we're using the same product that we used to actually configure the schema mapping to, to generate all of the data. And um, we've generated a, a predefined uh, template project that you can use. So it's no different to actually having a, a form field in, in this context. So for each of the various elements that are required, so for the author, you need to create a, an organization name and an email. You can simply just type, type the information in, so Snowflake Software Limited. And if you want to contact us about our, our brilliant Atom feed, you can contact us at info at, it's late in the day, I can't type today, snowflakesoftware.com. And again, just keep populating each of the required elements with the, with the various values that you need. And as you go along, creating the Atom feed is a little bit easier than using a generic text editor to, to build it. You can keep checking that your content's correct. And we've paused the Atom feed, so as you're going along creating it, you can keep validating that the Atom feed that you're generating um, is, is correct. So here I found that we're not creating the right data. So I have a problem. It's saying that something is not valid for date time. If I click on the link, it'll take me to the element that's, that's incorrect. So I've got a, a value. I haven't actually set the, the date that the Atom feed has been updated. So as we're going to, we can use a, a function of Go Publisher and use an automated system date. So automatically put, populate that value when the file is, is published with, the, with, the, with today's date. So I hit update preview. Great, my Atom feed is, is, is valid now. So I can then just simply create the Atom feed. And repeat that process again for each of the data set feeds that we've got in the, in the data. And with this example that I'm going to use with the Atom feeds, we've also used Go Publisher to, to create the data itself. And what we're going to do is just publish the data as individual files that are going to be uploaded onto, uh, onto, onto Tomcat. So you'll just be able to download the, the data itself. So it's just, you'll just download a flat file. You're not accessing the data at all through a fancy web service. So I repeated that process again using Go Publisher to also generate all of the, the ISO metadata. So I've created some metadata for the, for the Atom feed. So if I take out that. Again, you can use just the one tool to be able to create the data, create the metadata, create the Atom feed, and also the open search description document and uh, generate kind of your Inspire download service. So if I go into projects, Inspire online. So in my Inspire folder, I've created all of the data for each of the, so it, the, the European Natura 2000 data set is actually gonna be published as 25 individual um, subsets and the Atom feeds and, and the metadata as well. That I'm just going to upload those onto the internet. So I've already done this ahead of the, the workshop. So We've also created a, a kind of landing page. So most organizations, they also, I know what I've done. They um, want to actually 
publicize what data sets they hold on their own website. So we've replicated a, a similar thing there. So now that I've started my service, so we've just created a, a landing page that actually states that um, what data set we've got. But rather than explaining what the data set is, it's just explaining what the atom feeds are. So if you, at the bottom, you go to the top level feeds, this will give you a link um, to the atom feed itself. And if you use Opera, it's a little bit more intelligent than, than some of the other um, generic web browsers, like uh, Chrome, which will just give you the feedback in XML. Um, it actually goes and finds all of the links that are in the entry so that you can go and then follow these through to actually gain access to each of the individual data sets. So if you follow the Atom feed through to get to the Greece data set feed, it then takes you through and here it shows you that this, the data set is available in two formats. So you can download it in ETRS 89 or you can download it in WGS 84. And if you're interested in this da data set or the whole feed as itself, you can actually subscribe to, to the feed using any of the generic um, feed readers such as Google Reader. So as soon as I then update this for say the 2012 version of the data set, in, if, when you log into your feed reader tomorrow, you'll see that I've updated the data set and then you can just follow this link. If I that now click on it, and be patient, it actually takes you directly to the data set to download it. And from there, you can save it to your desktop and you can start, start directly using it. So in whatever your preferred GIS system. So for the demo purposes, I'll just use QGIS. Open the wrong thing. All files, XML. Can anyone see XML in that list? I knew something would go wrong in this. Everything was going so well. Live demos, it's always a fail at some point. So, yes, take it from me. I'll, I'll not spend time trying to visualize it in QGIS. I know that you can and, and you can. This, is, this demo is going to be available um, on our website next week, so you can absolutely feel free to, to kind of download all of the data, play with it, and, and do what you like. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the really simple demo of how to create an Atom feed. Um, there was a session next door, which some of you may or may not have been in, um, which demoed some additional, way more cool things than this. So if you include a GRSS polygon, you can view the Atom feed in in uh, Google Earth and Google Maps and use that as the mechanism. But for most generic users, once you've found the feed, you subscribe to it. And the key, key benefit that it has is that it will alert you as soon as the next version of the data set is available. So it keeps you completely up to date. Right. Ooh. So again, this slide just shows that the version of the Atom feed that we've got online, um, you can subscribe to it in, in Google Reader, and then as soon as you update it, it will flag that it's, a, it's available. So yeah, Atom feed, it's the really good, the nice, simple way of, of uh, providing access to your data. But on the, on the other side of the, uh, the other options that you've got is to set up a, a predefined or just at WFS that either provides access to the spatial data set in exactly the same way as we saw through the Atom feed, or allow you to directly um, download the data. So an OGC web feature service, it's a much more sophisticated type of service for downloading and directly accessing data compared to an Atom feed, um, as it supports the ability for the users to just ask for the data that they're interested in, rather than the data that you, that you provide, want to provide them. Um, 
In the technical specifications document itself, it actually states that, that a WFS has to support the get dataset operation and the get dataset by ID stored queries, in addition to optional support for full querying capability. So if you're just going to set up a WFS that just serves spatial datasets, you must make sure that whichever WFS that you, that you're gonna, that you choose to use, that um, it must implement, you just got to check that it implements the following uh, conformance classes from the WFS specification. So look to see that there's a tick in the box for a simple WFS. So that allows you to at least do stored queries and be able to, um, yeah, at least do stored queries. It won't allow you to do any ad full querying capability. Uh, any, the WFS only has to support the HTTP GET protocol. Um, and it must in implement the Inspire extended capabilities. But if you're going to go for the full, full kind of shebang and, and, and implement the lot and provide ac allow your users to gain access to, to the data, full access to the data use via direct access, then you must check that the WFS implements the, the basic WFS conformance class. Because in that, it will meet all the requirements for the, the spatial filtering and everything that I mentioned before. Um, and another key requirement is that for each individual data set, you must set up a separate WFS instance if you're going to provide access to the data through a direct access service. From our perspective, the great news is we've implemented all of the W, uh, we implement uh, the WFS basic conformance class. So with the exception of having to just do a little bit of work to add in the Inspire extended capabilities, we're good to go. We kind of meet the requirements for an Inspire download service. So I'll give you a really quick demonstration about how to, to set up the, the WFS. So again, it's a similar process, uh, apart from you've got to con update the, the configuration mapping for the initial uh, schema transformation that you generated to create the data. Configure the get capabilities metadata that just states what the service can and can't do and what data sets it provides. And then it's a simple one click of a button to generate the WFS and another click to actually deploy it onto, the, onto Tomcat. Um, externally to that process, again, you must create some um, ISO metadata that describes that service and publish it into, the ins into an Inspire download service. Um, and then the next step would be to deploy it and create the stored query for the get da dataset by ID, uh, mandatory stored query, and then just test it. So that's what we're going to go through in a, in a second. Um, but one Setting up this demo, because the download service technical guidelines is, is fairly new, um, there was a, actually configuring a WFS as a direct access WFS to serve individual features is really, really easy because that's how a WFS is, is meant to work. Getting it to serve predefined data sets was a, was a little bit more of a challenge. Um, so I, I spent some time wrestling constant back and forth with the question, what do I, how do I serve the data um, in, the, in the WFS? Do I just provide access to the individual protected sites? Or should the protected sites, should there be uh, an Inspire spatial data set feature that contains, as the access, the predefined data set? Um, I have been awaiting clarification up until about two hours ago, and I got it. So. The, the, the way to do it is to actually just provide access to the WFS serving up individual features. So, before I got that clarification though, um, I did go through three different options. So, setting up the WFS as a, as a predefined data set download service only, um, where I mapped the protected sites to be contained within that base spatial data set feature that's available in the generic conceptual model. It's a good option. It's really easy to set up, it took me two minutes. Um, the download, the, the, but there's a lot of cons to, to that approach. Because you've wrapped the, the individual protect features within a container feature, you can't access the individual features themselves. 
And I found out that the GET capabilities metadata statement itself, it only says that you serve data sets. It doesn't tell you what kind of um, inspire features or special <coughs> objects that you're serving. So I ruled that out as an option. Don't do that. Option two is to configure the WFS to, to again, serve both the protected sites as individual features themselves, so you can um, request them. So do a, get me all the features within a, within a specific bounding box. Um, but also to meet that requirement that the WFS has to provide access to predefined data sets, I looked at, at the option to create a spatial data set feature which just contains a list of all the features. So it just references to the individual features themselves. So rather than encoding them in line. And again, that worked. That was great. But um, it requires that each WFS to support an additional parameter that's not defined within the base, basic WFS conformance class. So you, each WFS has to support this thing called resolve. And what Resolve will do is it will get the spatial data set, then it will go and find all of the features that are, that are linked, that are contained in the list, and add that to the response document. Um, and whilst that's great, it does, it does work. Quite a few of the vendors are, are implementing Resolve. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a, a while before the client uh, will support that response document. So I went for option three in the end to just configure the WFS to serve only features, no spatial data sets, just protected sites features. Um, and I defined a, a get data set by ID stored query that will generate predefined subsets of features by requesting the data based on its country code. So the data set ID is simply the country code for, for the data set. Alternatively, it could be a bounding box extent. And that, that worked really well. Um, it supports all the requirements. It was really easy to set up. And it doesn't require the, the WFS to support anything too complex. And by publishing the, the data set, each data set is a separate WFS instance. Um, it ensures that the data set's ID, are, IDs are unique. Oh. Right. Live demo number two. Let's see which. So if I close that project, say project, no. So this is the original um, Go Publisher project that I used to configure the mapping to actually generate the, the um, to convert the original data into the Inspire protected sites theme. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to generate a, an, an interoperable Inspire download service. And all that we had to do to configure the WFS was change the, the root element so that it serves it as a WFS feature collection rather than a, a spatial data set and add in some additional mandatory attributes. So it will tell you how many features meet the, re the request and how many re were returned, for example and then just generate the, the service capabilities. So Go Publisher itself automatically generates over half of the, the Get Capabilities document. All that you need to do is add in some information about the service itself, so give it a name, uh, some, again, some just basic metadata that should be similar to the met what you put into the, the actual ISO metadata itself. Define the bounding extent of, of the data. Um, and Go Publisher has the ability to do on-the-fly coordinate reference system transformation. So it, it will support way more coordinate reference system transformations than what you might actually um, state in the, in, the, in the list here. So we've configured it so that by default it provides access to the data in ETRS 89 and, and also WGIS 84. If you want to add extend that list, then this list will populate itself with only the coordinate reference systems that Go Publisher will automatically transform them to. So you simply just select any, all the ones that apply from that list, from that drop down. And 
This configuration bit will be extended to add in the requirements for the Inspire extended capabilities. So again, you'll see a new tab appear in the next, next month or so, the next couple of months. And once you've configured all of that, it's simply just one click to generate the, the WFS. So if you're having to generate or establish multiple WFS instances, we have this two-stage deployment which will allow you to deploy thousands of WFSs on a single Tomcat instance, so it's really scalable. So again, it takes just a couple of seconds to generate the WFS, which you then deploy onto Tomcat. So I have to prove that it's deployed. So here you can just check that the get capabilities operation works properly, so all of the metadata that you've put in um, works. So go publish your WFS. It implements WFS2, which is one of the requirements for Inspire, but it also simultaneously supports the previous versions. So if you've got clients that will only support 1.1, you can set up a WFS2 using Go Publisher, and it will still work with your existing applications and everything. So backwards compatibility is, is great. So we've now set up our, our WFS, and it will allow users to um, request or get access to individual features. So to test that it works and it is deployed properly, uh, we've created a, a generic sample which will get you the first 10 protected sites. So we can see that there's 20, nearly 24,500 features in the, in the WFS, and we've just returned 10. But in order for us to meet this requirement that we've got to serve predefined data sets, uh, we need to create a, a stored query. And to do that, you simply define A, WFS, a, a general WFS query, and then wrap that into uh, something called a create stored query operation uh, within, that's within the WFS, and post that to the server. So in this example that we've got, all of the GML ID, all of the identifiers for each of the features start with a country code. So we can create uh, predefined subsets of the data by just selecting the data based on their country code. So we've created a property is like filter based on its GML ID um, where the value is going to be its data set ID so it will be the two digit country code and we've also added in an additional parameter that will allow you to specify an alternate coordinate reference system to request the data in. So if I Go back to here. If I copy that and paste it into the, to the form, and we send it to the WFS, it's now responded back saying, OK, it's really happy. We've now created our stored, stored query. So go back to the overview. And if we go into our, our list stored queries operation, you can now see that we've created our, our WFS query get data set by ID. So if I now try and test that, so, and, and here's one I've made earlier type. So here's one I've made earlier. So if I scroll along, you can see that we have a get feature request with the stored query ID, with the parameter set as a data set ID, with the country code of, of Cyprus. If I hit it, we get just the data back from Cyprus. So if I pick another country, just to check that it's not. So if I put MT for Malta, it will come back. Opera is quite useful, so if you wanted to just do some very kind of crude um, testing to understand what the quality of service is of, you, of your service, you can use this quick, quick download. So if I ask for Germany, that's quite a big data set. We can see that 
uh, on the speed side how the WFS is responding. So it responded back almost instantly, so way within the 10 seconds, and it's returning the data just on my local machine, which is really not that powerful, at uh, um, nearly four, four megs a second. So, it, yeah. So you can do some basic things. So that was my really quick, quick demo to show you that once you, the hardest part of setting up the, uh, the, the actual service itself is defining the schema transformation. So once you've done that, whether you want to set up a, an, an Atom feed or, or a WFS, or an Atom feed where, the, where it links to those stored queries, you can do, that's another option that you can, you can do. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, it's, it took me um, three, three days to build both of those demos once I understood what, I, what it was that I was meant to do. So to, con to, to kind of finish off my, my little demo for implementing the Inspire download services. So you've got three options for Inspire, for, for Inspire download service. Generating Atom feeds or setting up a WFS, well there's two really, and the WFS can either just provide access to only predefined data sets or it can provide access to both individual features and the predefined data sets using that stored, stored query get data set by ID. And again, the deadlines for actually setting up your download services, they're, they're pretty quick. They're, they're coming up soon. So thankfully, they've now finally released this final version of the technical guidelines because for the Annex 1 data providers, you've only got six months left. And for the Annex 3, you, you guys need to start thinking about what, what it is, what data sets um, fall within scope of Inspire and how you want to provide access to the data because you've only got 18 months left. Good news is the tool sets, as they stand right now, they're, they're good enough to, to actually get going. And within, before this uh, December deadline, most tools will support, fully support the technical guidance document. So that's it, that's it for me. I uh, hope you enjoyed my very quick demo and an overview of actually what's in the, the download service uh, specification. And if you've got any questions, I'm happy to take them now, but I'm aware that we all want to get on that boat and enjoy the boat trip. So if you don't ask them now, come and find me um, on the Snowflake stand. I'll be here for the whole rest of the conference. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, may I have your attention please? Uh, there will be a boss boss tour and you can go to flat uh, floor 3B, B3, sorry. Uh, there, will be, there will be shuttles for uh, boss boss tour and it will be at 5.45 p.m. and the second shuttle is at uh, 6.15 p.m. Thank you.